and welcome back to the lists of my favorite albums. Not your favorites, my favorites. Deal with it. Let's get back to business, shall we? Honorable mention number six, Layla and Other Assorted Love Songs by Derek and the Dominoes. I guess you could call this one my 11th favorite album of all time. Those rare moments when it drags a little keeps it out of my top 10. Anyway, I usually recoil in horror when I see a double album because it usually equals not enough good stuff to fill a single album spread out over an overpriced double album. One double album, albeit now single CD, that escapes that stigma is the only studio album by Derek and the Dominoes, Derek equaling Dwayne Allman and Eric Clapton. If ever there was a soundtrack to new and especially unrequited love, this would have to be it. The original songs are passionate, the covers play like they were written to order, and the band keeps on pushing itself to greater heights. This is an album that cannot be played at a low volume. Haters of lengthy guitar solos might want to skip this one, though. Honorable mention number seven, The Allman Brothers Band, by The Allman Brothers Band. Sticking with The Allmans for a bit here, where Layla was a defining in-love album, this has got to be one of the defining out-of-love albums. Honestly, I doubt the Allman Brothers intended this as a breakup album. I think it was just one of those side effects of the blues. But regardless, the songs, even the one instrumental, have an angry, hurt, and often accusatory quality to them. The production is raw and harsh, the playing is dagger sharp, and Greg Allman, who wrote all but two of the songs, sounds like he just had his heart ripped out. But above all, it's just a great collection of songs. Honorable mention number eight, Shoot Out the Lights by Richard and Linda Thompson. Continuing with the breakup album concept, this is the sound of a relationship collapsing. Although if Richard Thompson is to be believed, it was totally unintentional. Even the songs that seemingly have no relationship to, well, relationships, seem to evoke the feeling of futility, maybe a little too well. In the non-shock of the century, this was Richard and Linda's last album, and the two were divorced by the end of that year. Honorable mention number nine, the first two Pure Prairie League albums, their self-titled debut and Bustin' Out. Yeah, I know I'm cheating a bit here, but these two albums have always felt like a piece to me. These two albums are very much on the more progressive end of the country rock sphere. The influences are more varied, and there's more willingness to take odd detours than most in the genre, yet the songs are consistent to the point where it all coheres nicely. Amy was the big hit, but you haven't really heard that one until you've heard it in the greater context of the Bustin' Out album. And honorable mention number 10, Music from Big Pink by The Band. It seems like the band's self-titled follow-up gets most of the good press, but I've always much preferred their debut. Whereas their self-titled disc seems intent on streamlining the band's sound and songwriting, Music from Big Pink plays like the group just wants to do their thing, whatever that might be. It's psychedelic without feeling druggy, it's country without getting corny, and it sounds like nothing else before or since. However, it does lose focus occasionally, which is what keeps it confined to honorable mention status. And now, my remaining five all-time favorite albums. Number six, Abbey Road by The Beatles. I admit, I much prefer the later, more adventurous Beatles. Now, this wasn't their last released album, but it was their last recorded. And to me, this is where everything the Beatles had worked for during their run truly crystallized. 
The songs run the gamut from sweet to silly to heavy. Everything flows naturally. The production is astoundingly good for 1969, or even the 21st century. You've got great singles, great album cuts, and of course, the classic 16-minute Abbey Road Suite, which closes the album and the Beatles' career. Number 7. Silk Purse by Linda Ronstadt I can just hear the complaints now. How the hell could Derek and the Dominoes, Elvis Costello, and Kate Bush only get stuck with honorable mention status, but Linda Ronstadt makes the final cut? Well, one of my determining factors when making my top 10 was, how much of an impact did the album have on me personally? When I first heard this album at 16, I had been trying to write my own songs and, you know, maybe even have my own music career. And while I had heard some albums that pushed the boundaries of rock slash pop music, they all seemed to stay within the bounds of rock and pop. This album felt like an all-out middle finger to those conventions. I had never heard an album that bounced along from country to rock to girl group pop, and sometimes all at once, all the while flowing along like a progressive rock album. It shattered my preconceptions about what you supposedly could and couldn't do on an album, and it inspired me to follow my musical bliss genre be damned. Oh yeah, Anne Ronstadt just had a great ear for other people's songs. Number 8. Desperado by the Eagles. You, you like the Eagles? Yeah, well, to quote one of their songs, get over it. And yes, I promise this is the last country rock album I'm discussing. Now, for those that think of the Eagles as Take It Easy and Hotel California and little else, this album could severely alter your perceptions of these guys. This album is a loose concept album, presumably about the Dalton Gang. Musically, it bounces viciously between bluegrass, hard rock, and classic Eagles-isms. Bernie Ledden's multi-instrumental prowess dominates the album and pushes the rest of the group well outside of its comfort zone and gives the album a flavor unlike any of their others which must have helped earn the album the dubious honor of being their only one to miss the top 40. Despite that, if you have a taste for country rock, it is compulsively listenable. Number 9. Nilsson Schmilson by Harry Nilsson Harry Nilsson made some very good albums, but balance was one thing that seemed to usually elude the man. But for one brief shining moment in 1971, the moon and stars seemed to line up just right. Nilsson Schmilson hits all the eclectic bullseyes that the man was best known for, and it spread them out just right. And I'd imagine producer Richard Perry helped on that front. In a lot of ways, this album, save for the grandiose cover of Bad Fingers Without You, this album plays more like a 21st century indie pop album than an early 70s singer-songwriter album, albeit with far better songs and far less image-driven posturing. The songs themselves don't seem to follow any particular theme or tone, but the album still plays out more like a suite than a garden-variety pop album. It's been one of my favorites since I first heard it at 14 or 15, and I love it just as much, if not more, today. Number 10. The Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. In what has to be one of the least surprising statements I've ever made, my favorite album of all time is Pink Floyd's 1973 masterwork, Dark Side of the Moon. I can't think of another album as focused, tight, accomplished, and yet at the same time as experimental as this one. The overreaching theme of the album is those things that weigh on everybody to at least some degree, money, time, war, violence, mortality, 
And maybe that's how such an otherwise uncommercial album achieved such universal appeal. Like most Pink Floyd albums, it plays out as a suite as opposed to just a collection of songs, and the album would not work otherwise. There are whole books out there on this album, so I won't dig any deeper here. All I can say is, I can't imagine my life without this album. For a music geek like me, compiling such a small list was really hard. Uh, it just it hurt like hell to have to leave off favorites from Bob Dylan, Frank Zappa, Jackson Brown, Graham Parker, and a whole bunch of others. But I think anyone that has watched Archive Enough already has a pretty good grasp of my relationship with a pretty broad range of music. But uh, anyway, as for the albums that I've discussed over these last two videos, I think they're all available to listen to on YouTube, and I think they're all available to listen to on all or most streaming services, and I also believe they're all still in print in some way, shape, or form. So, uh, you know, if you're so inclined, there's no reason for you to not go exploring. But otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this little detour of mine away from the usual Ben's junks and the stuff that I plug those weeks between archive episodes with. And I await your great disappointment in and disapproval of my choices. <laughs>